Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Cutting Costs for Cutting Carbon, Low-Cost Pathways for Direct Air Capture. My name is Mukunda Kaushik, Senior Analyst at Lux Research, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Presenting today is my colleague, Thomas Briggs, Research Associate at Lux Research. Throughout the webinar, you can type any questions you have in the question box on your screen. Time permitting, we'll answer all the questions we can. If your question does not get answered, please don't hesitate to email it to questions at luxresearchinc.com and we'll respond. Now, let's jump into the presentation. So over to you, Thomas. Thanks, Mukunda. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. So today's webinar is going to focus on direct air capture. Now, this is the capture of CO2 uh, directly from ambient air. If you're familiar with DAC, uh, you know it's a very high cost technology. But I think it's important to visualize just how high cost it is currently. So in order to do that, I, I put a few numbers together. The IEA projects a need for 985 million tons per year of direct air capture capacity by 2050. But currently, uh, DAC costs range anywhere from $700 to $1,000 US per ton of CO2. So if costs were to remain the same, uh, then the globe's yearly expenditure on direct air capture would be above $700 billion. Uh, equal to the GDP of the world's 20th largest country, uh, or larger than the economies of countries like Switzerland and Turkey, which you can see on the right there. But despite the high cost today, uh, companies do need to seriously consider DAC for three main reasons. First, it's needed as a corrective measure to refossilize carbon and remove CO2 from circulation in both the natural and industrial carbon cycle. Second, it's needed to secure a non-fossil carbon feedstock that can sustain future energy demand um, from both energy and chemical value chains. And lastly, it's needed as a high quality offset tool for industry, uh, either to buy time as more permanent decarbonization solutions become commercial uh, or to offset any of those final unabatable emissions. Now, in order to satisfy these three business cases, we need a lot of DAC. Currently, however, the world is operating DAC at a fraction of a megaton per year. With some of the announced projects like Occidental and Carbon Engineering's 500,000 ton per year facility launch next year, uh, as well as the upcoming DOE hubs, uh, we may see a big jump in capacity in 2025. But what happens after that? Well, different scenarios have different projections, but all agree that gigaton scale DAC is needed by 2050. But reaching this scale is dependent on cost. Uh, and that's what we really start to see with the Global CCS Institute's capacity forecast in this figure. Now, according to the Institute, if DAC costs come down to about $137 per ton, then capacity goes up to seven gigatons. But if the industry only reaches a cost of $240 a ton, then global capacity caps at two gigatons. So the cost reduction of DAC is really important. Uh, and that's what today's webinar is gonna focus on. How can companies bring their DAC cost down? Now, by looking at the startup ecosystem today, we can identify three main mechanisms. I would like to note that the costs we're gonna show over the next few slides are claims directly from specific companies. We're gonna start with these figures and then look at Lux's cost model for some of these specific technologies. So the first way in which companies can bring down costs is through learning curves. This relies very heavily on learning by doing, uh, improvements in process efficiency that are gained as you move from a first of a kind facility to a next iteration. And this is really what companies building larger stick built DAC systems, uh, such as those within calcium looping, uh, this is the approach those companies are taking. The second is modularity, uh, and this applies more towards low temperature sorbent based systems. Uh, these systems have smaller footprints and can be scaled in series. And because of the better economies of scale compared to those relying just on learning curves, uh, companies in this category can expect to reduce their costs at least to $250 to $300 per ton. Um, but that's still not really where we need it to be. 
And that's where the third technology path, or the third pathway comes in, that being technology innovation. Now, technology innovation involves doing DAC in a fundamentally different way. Uh, you change a process, a component, a thermodynamic pathway. Um, it's done specifically to target a cost sinking step. Uh, and we really see companies who take this approach expecting to get costs much lower, much faster. So what components actually influence the cost of DAC? Uh, and how are companies hoping to achieve this cost reduction? Well, it begins with the technology. Now, what kind of technology pathway you choose fundamentally determines critical metrics like CapEx, uh, heat and electricity consumption. So we segment DAC technologies into six categories, calcium looping, amine, zeolite, and metal organic framework sorbents, hybrid electroswing, and full electroswing. But other than these technology factors and the technology itself, you also have market factors that can influence the cost of DAC. The two key segments here are the energy prices and the subsidies available. Regions with abundant cheap renewable energy can find an edge in deployments. A really interesting example of this is Chela Mineral Storage's DAC project in Kenya. Uh, the company is leveraging the region's abundant geothermal energy uh, to secure five DAC partners for deployments in the coming few years. Now, while it's great to have low cost geothermal, unfortunately, the region's not as strong in the subsidy category. Uh, we really have seen that a huge magnitude of funding, uh, such as the USD 4 billion the US government has made available for DAC projects, uh, this kind of magnitude of funding is required to scale, to megaton scale. I would like to note that the influences of each of these three factors, so the technology, the energy, and the subsidies, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, you have to unlock the value of all three of these uh, to realize the ideal scenario for DAC cost reduction. Now, although we have identified six relevant DAC technology categories, today we're gonna examine the cost reduction potential of two, calcium looping, which is one of the initial DAC technologies, and hybrid electroswing, uh, which we have identified as a high potential technology for the future of DAC. Our techno-economic analysis examines deploying a reference first of a kind one megaton per year facility. The cost analysis for each technology includes the CapEx, so the system and the material, the OpEx, which assumes that heat and electricity are the main cost components here, um, and some other auxiliary cost components. Uh, we're gonna break down current costs and provide a cost forecast through 2050 based on a CapEx learning curve. All right, without further ado, uh, let's examine our first technology, calcium looping. Now, calcium looping is a process in which CO2 reacts with alkali metal hydroxides to form carbonates. Now, in order to desorb CO2, the carbonates are then decomposed at temperatures between 700 and 1000 C in a calcine. Uh, this regenerates the hydroxide, which can then be recycled for further use. Uh, it's one of the first mover DAC technologies. It uses well understood reaction chemistry, uh, very readily available sorbents. Uh, I would like to highlight carbon engineering as a notable developer here. Uh, the company was acquired by Occidental for a billion dollars and are currently planning to deploy a 500,000 ton per year system in 2025. The biggest drawback to this approach is its use of high temperature heat, uh, which is more challenging to both obtain and decarbonize. Currently, uh, we estimate calcium looping costs at $725 a ton, with the bulk of this cost being in the capex. Uh, this is largely due to calcium looping requiring heavy industrial equipment, uh, such as calciners and causticizers to operate. When we examine the cost reduction curve to 2050, uh, we expect costs to ultimately decrease to around $300 per ton. Now, this is mainly due to CapEx savings and operational efficiency improvements. Although the need for high temperature heat does keep calcium looping integrated with the natural gas infrastructure, 
it is still possible to obtain high temperature heat from renewable electricity. Unfortunately, the constant load required for continuous DAC operations uh, means you need a significant amount of electricity and you will likely require something like uh, thermal energy storage. Uh, so today, it's simply just cheaper to source your heat from natural gas rather than electricity. Um, therefore, we see that this pathway is going to primarily rely on learning curves for cost reduction. But electrifying this process is an important innovation to the incumbent technology. So let's take a look at one company doing this, that being Heirloom. Uh, you may have heard of these guys recently in the news with the launch of their 1,000 ton per year commercial facility in California uh, in November of last year. Uh, the company is currently attempting to overcome this barrier to the technology um, by implementing electric kilns through its partner Lilac. Uh, this should enable them to decouple from that natural gas infrastructure. Now, it does intend to deploy these, the, these electric kilns and this technology at its facilities moving forward. Um, and this includes at their upcoming DOE hub uh, in partnership with Climeworks. Okay, so now we have taken a look at an incumbent. Uh, let's take a look at a novel technology uh, and one that we really think is exciting, uh, hybrid electros. This approach combines a traditional adsorption process so your solvents, your sorbents, your membranes uh, with an electrochemical desorption system. Uh, it typically uses very well understood acid base reactions such as that hydroxide to carbonate cycle um, at very low to ambient temperatures um, in a no heat all electric process. So we just spoke about calcium looping uh, and you can really see some parallels between the two. Uh, they both use hydroxides but instead of one using a calciner at 1000 C for desorption, um, the other has uh, a simple acid base regeneration, uh, which allows for very close to ambient temperature operations. Now we call it hybrid because you do still rely on what these chemical solvents, uh, sorbents, these membranes do well in the adsorption phase, uh, but you couple that with an electric desorption component. Uh, a full electro swing system utilizes a process that, that's more like a battery. I think it's important to note that it's a very early stage technology. Uh, most of these companies and players were founded in the last three years, uh, but commercial momentum is, is really growing very rapidly. All of these hybrid electro swing companies have raised funding in the past three years, uh, and several are expected to deploy their initial pilots in 2025. Uh, these pilots are going to be critical to validate both their claimed bench scale metrics um, and live system performance. Past this technology validation, uh, the key challenge as these companies scale up is going to be sourcing electrochemical components and securing access to renewable electricity. We currently see that hybrid electro swing costs at around, are at around uh, $683 a ton. Um, and I would like to note that this is based on the limited data we have available from early stage projects, uh, given that this is a very early stage technology. Um, but what is really exciting about hybrid electro swing uh, is its potential to really dramatically reduce the energy consumption to about 2.5 gigajoules per ton, which is fully powered by electricity. Uh, this can lead to a very low OPEX cost. When we look at the cost reduction curve going to 2050, uh, we expect very high cost reduction potential, uh, primarily driven by capex reduction and the lack of heat. Uh, this leads to a final cost of around $129 per ton by 2050. Um, this is a very early stage technology, so the initial pilots will not be operating at 100% capacity uh, and will have to rely or will have electricity consumptions. Uh, reported to be higher than the 2.5 gigajoules per ton that we're using as a reference. Um, but we do see them able to bring this down uh, as their process efficiencies improve. So again here, uh, you can draw a comparison to calcium looping because while both can have capex reduction, 
Uh, one hybrid electro swing is going to save on OPEX, uh, and the other will not. So let's take a look at three case studies that display the concept of hybrid electro swing. Uh, one that couples solvents with an electrochemical approach, one that couples sorbents, and one that couples membranes. First, we're going to take a look at Carbon Atlantis. Uh, this company utilizes a pH swing approach that splits a solvent into an acid and a base. The base is then used as the CO2 capture medium, and once it's saturated, it's then re-exposed to the acid to recombine into the original solvent, which releases the CO2. So in this way, the company is really shifting where the electrochemistry is applied uh, in the adsorption desorption sequence, um, but it is still currently in the very early stages of piloting. Um, it's planning to launch a few 260 ton per year systems in the coming years. Um, and furthermore, it actually has an undisclosed capacity partnership with previously mentioned uh, Chela Mineral Storage in Kenya. The next company I would like to highlight here is Carbominer. Uh, they develop a system that utilizes an ion exchange sorbent uh, to capture the CO2 from ambient air. Once this sorbent is saturated, it's then flushed with an alkaline solution that transfers the CO2 from the sorbent to the solution. And then the company utilizes uh, a, one of its proprietary electrochemical processes to release the CO2. Now, Notably, this company does have a very high energy consumption at over 10 gigajoules per ton. However, it is still in the early stages of piloting, having completed some initial testing in, in 2023. The final company I would like to highlight here is Repair. Uh, this is an Israeli startup that utilizes an electrochemical cell and current to trigger the binding of CO2 and hydroxides at its cathode forming bicarbonates. It then drives these bicarbonates through a selectively permeable membrane to the anode. Uh, at the anode, CO2 desorbs and the reformed hydroxides are consumed. Uh, CO2-free air is released at the cathode and a 97% CO2 purity stream is released at the anode. A uh, company is also in the early stages. It currently has one operational pilot uh, on the roof of its facility in Israel, actually. Okay, so we have now taken uh, an in-depth look at two of the six technology fields, but we have also conducted this level of analysis for all six of these technologies. Uh, before we get into the conclusions, I would like to get a chance to touch on them all um, even though we, we can't necessarily examine them to the same level of detail. So uh, just to recap calcium looping, uh, we see a cost reduction potential to around $298 per ton by 2050. Um, these systems are large systems that use readily available materials, uh, but are hindered by the need for high temperature heat and high capex equipment, such as causticizers and calciners. Amine sorbents are another commercially ready technology, um, very notably being deployed by Climeworks in its recent Mammoth facility scale up. Um, it's currently a low cost technology at around $400 per ton, $420 per ton. Um, and we expect that cost to decrease to around $140 per ton uh, by 2050. Uh, several developers are targeting this technology pathway due to its benefits of requiring only low grade heat um, and the potential to develop easily scalable uh, modular systems. Now, zeolite sorbents are another technology that has a relatively low current cost at around $490 per ton, but it has a low cost reduction potential to only $287 per ton. Uh, the zeolite materials are, are very cheap, uh, very readily available, um, but they have a very high desorption temperature, um, which leads to in turn, a high energy consumption requirement of around 18 gigajoules per ton. Now, additionally, uh, the presence of water vapor in the air can negatively impact the zeolite material performance. So, 
metal organic framework sorbents uh, actually have a, have a pretty unique cost position uh, at over $4,500 per ton of CO2. Um, and we see the cost reduction potential down to only about uh, $1,200 to $1,300 per ton of CO2. Um, the materials do have uh, some promising performance metrics. Uh, this includes a, a, a low total energy consumption of 5.7 gigajoules per ton. Um, and the potential to introduce some novel desorption pathways, uh, including something like moisture swing. Uh, but the limitation is that the overall cost of the capture material, so the metal organic framework itself, uh, is currently extremely high. So the cost reduction potential of this pathway is going to depend very heavily on the cost reduction potential of MOF material platform manufacturing, um, which has really yet to be determined by uh, the industry. So then to recap hybrid electro swing, uh, it is a promising pathway that we see having a cost reduction potential as low as, as $129 per ton, uh, primarily due to its use of an all electric process and low or ambient temperature operations. Uh, however, uh, this technology field is still in the very early stages of development and material performance in this uh, is gonna be determined by upcoming industry pilots. Finally, um, for full electro swing, uh, this is a system that relies on electricity both for CO2 adsorption as well as CO2 desorption. Now, we expect a cost reduction potential from USD $200 per ton to USD $136 per ton. Um, and the systems really have some of the lowest potential energy consumptions at 1.8 to 2 gigajoules per ton, but uh, they're mostly still in lab phase. So activity is primarily at the bench scale. Um, now, as these systems begin to scale, um, begin to pilot, developers are going to need to make sure that they do not rely on critical minerals um, for their electrochemical systems. Uh, that'll be the key challenge here. Okay, so what does this all mean? Uh, what are the key takeaways for DAC moving forward? Well, first, we have to acknowledge that the early DAC pilots are not gonna be fully reflective of the costs and performances that we expect to see at scale. The costs that we examined uh, in this presentation today uh, were of a one megaton per year facility, um, but near-term pilots are gonna have smaller capacities and higher costs. Uh, this is, still a new technology, DAC generally. Um, so scale up and performance research improvement are gonna need to happen concurrently. Second, technology in innovation is the most important cost reduction pathway for the future of DAC. We really can see this reflected in the comparisons between calcium looping and hybrid electro swing. Um, both use a similar, similar adsorption material, uh, similar chemistries, um, but they fundamentally change the desorption mechanism, uh, thus making a high temperature process a low temperature process, uh, reducing energy consumption, and now there's, there's high cost reduction potential. So third, um, the spread of DAC across different regions is gonna depend both on the energy resources and prices available, uh, as well as government subsidies. Uh, we can see that the benefits of the IRA tax credits in helping DAC become cost competitive are evident. Um, they've really made the US uh, one of the most attractive regions for deployment and have positioned it to be the first to execute on uh, a megaton capacity scale. However, um, in the future, uh, other regions with low cost renewables and regulatory benefits or drivers uh, will be the host to future projects. Now, I think that brings us to the end. So I'd like to say thank you for listening and then open it up for questions. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we will now be taking any questions that you may have on the presentation today. And I see a few coming in already. Uh, if we don't get to your questions on the call, uh, someone from Lux will be in touch after the webinar. First question. Uh, you mentioned Chala and Africa, some of the DOE hubs. Are there any other regions that you're seeing with a lot of activity for data capture? Yeah, I definitely think there's a few more to call out. Um, I would say the first one being Canada. 
So here there's a, there's a really notable project developer, Deep Sky. Um, they're aiming to set up several CO2 removal projects um, coupled with sequestration to generate carbon credits. Um, and then, you know, to accomplish this goal, it's, it's really assembled a, a very strong partnership network of about 10 partners. Um, and this includes some big players like Climeworks, um, as well as some of the smaller, maybe developmental players um, like hybrid electric swing company, Carbon Alanis. Now, each of these partner facilities is going to be deploying at different times, different timelines, um, and different capacities over the next five years. Uh, the big benefit for these companies deploying in Canada is that Canada does ac actually have access to uh, a pretty strong investment tax credit, which, you know, it currently offers a 60% credit on carbon capture equipment for DAC. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a pretty strong regulatory driver there from the subsidy perspective. Um, I think the other region really to call out is, is the Middle East. Um, and here we see mineralization firm 4401. Um, taking a similar approach to Chella um, in terms of how it's developing its projects. Uh, you know, it's a mineralization firm and it's assembling a network of, of DAC partners in order to provide some CO2 feedstock uh, for its mineralization projects there. So those are really, I think, the, the two regions I would, I would call out. Okay. Uh, the next question is a bit more on hybrid electric swing. So what is the timeline for commercialization for hybrid electric swing? And what are some signals that we can watch out for as this technology scales? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and really the first thing you're looking for is actually scale itself. Um, most of these companies are currently piloting in the, the 50 to 250 ton per year range at capacity. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a pretty far cry from, I think, some of the incumbents who are beginning to look at scales of thousands of tons per year, or, you know, someone like Carbon Engineering, who next year is looking to scale to hundreds of thousands of tons per year. Um, so I think once we see these hybrid electro swing companies begin to pilot, um, maybe begin to operate facilities in the, the thousand ton per year scale and range, um, that's absolutely one signal to watch out for. Um, the second is, you know, can any of these guys get involved in uh, DAC hubs? Uh, you know, so there's four DAC hubs, uh, two have been selected, um, but, you know, they're split between different project developers. So Project Cypress has Heirloom and Climeworks. Um, so, you know, if so, in some of these upcoming hubs, um, some of the ones that haven't been selected yet, if some of these hybrid electro swing startups can get involved with the hub projects at some level, um, that would be another very strong signal for the technology. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this seems to be a bit more of a statement than a question, but let's get your thoughts on it. Uh, the future of data capture is providing CO2 for e-fuels. Uh, yeah, I mean, in some circumstances, yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, right now, uh, DAC is, is really still too expensive to provide a viable uh, feedstock for e-fuel production. Um, and the other parts of the, the e-fuels value chain are, are still maturing as well. So today we actually, you know, we do see a lot of companies doing the sequestration and carbon credit business model um, in a lot of cases because it gives them some level of autonomy. You know, they're not dependent on value chain partners like they would be with e-fuels, um, but really, when we talk about like the future of DAC, it is dependent on other industrial decarbonization efforts. So, you know, if we fall short of our industrial decarbonization goals, then DAC plus sequestration is going to be a core part of the DAC business model um, as an offset tool in addition to e-fuels. Um, but if, uh, you know, as a globe, we successfully decarbonize industry by 2050, you know, that is everybody electrifies their industrial processes, everything's powered with renewables, um, then yeah, the future of DACs will primarily be e-fuels because there's gonna be less sequestration and offsetting needed. Um, but I think really, you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, we see a combination of both that being the removal and sequestration business model as well as e-fuels. Um, we see DAC being used for, for both of those pathways. Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas, again. That concludes our webinar for today. The slide presentation and the recording from this webinar will be sent to all attendees after the call today. 
After leaving the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a survey on today's presentation, and we would appreciate any feedback you may have to help inform our future webinars. Take a moment and check out our upcoming webinars that you see on the screen. And thank you for joining us and have a great day.